It's great to welcome back to the program today, Mike Rinder, former senior executive of the Church of Scientology and the Sea Organization, also author of the new book, A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology. Uh, Mike, great to have you on again, uh, as always. Thanks, David. It's wonderful to be back. So, I mean, in the interests of treading some new ground right up front, since the last time you've been here, you know, a lot of things have happened in the world that don't relate directly to Scientology. Mm -hmm. I think there's this feeling among some that the Church of Scientology right now is somewhat diminished, both in notoriety and maybe in strength because it's not really in the news as much as it once was. Is that a fair assessment or do you disagree with that? Oh, no, I think that's a very fair assessment, David. I think that Scientology has been dwindling as to its overall numbers and its influence, uh, primarily due to the Internet, also due to a lot of media coverage. You know, information is the enemy of high control organizations and groups and cults, and information is available to anybody that has a computer or a phone and can Google. And, you know, these days nobody buys a pair of shoes without Googling. Are these the best ones? Yeah. Uh, so it's very difficult for Scientology to get new people in. And so their numbers are diminishing, but I wouldn't say that that is diminishing their revenues yet, because what happens is you get organizations that are, you know, in a bubble of us versus them mentality. When the walls start closing in, the people inside feel more desperate that they have to do more, give more money, but like become more active and, and involved in order to save their particular cult from extinction. So probably Scientology is still raking in, you know, millions and millions a week, but that is an unsustainable model because eventually those people run dry and you have to have new people coming in and that is not happening. And, you know, you, you add to that the problems that have come up, you know, there's been this political race for the mayor's office in Los Angeles, which has turned into a mudslinging contest on who can shit on Scientology the biggest. And the Danny Masterson trial now started. A lot of things uh, are looking pretty dark in the world of Scientology right about now. In terms of the numbers, you know, I, I in uh, Lawrence Wright's book, Going Clear, uh, Wright writes that internal claims often allude to millions of members. I've read numbers as small as 30,000 globally, which which I don't even know. It sounds very low, but maybe it is that low. What's your sense of the membership at this point? Well, my estimate at this point is around twenty five thousand. Oh, wow. And That's the lowest I've heard anyone even state. Well, there's a few others uh, like who have that similar opinion. Um, uh, Aaron Smith Levin and Chris Shelton and Jeffrey Hawkins, Jefferson Hawkins, all of whom are former Sea Org people, uh, you know, high level executives in Scientology who had access in one way or another to information about membership. Scientology inflates their membership figures by claiming that anybody who has ever purchased a Scientology or Dianetics book therefore becomes a member because ah. we have their name and address from when they purchased the book. And over 50 years, there's been millions of people who purchased them. So ergo, there are millions of Scientologists. But if you look and see things like Scientology claims to have 15,000 members in the Tampa Bay area or in Clearwater. Right. Uh, you know, the numbers vary. But when Mark Bunker, who was a, a, a very avowed opponent of Scientology, ran for city council, the Clearwater City Council, he won with 5,000 votes. So they couldn't round up enough votes to prevent Mark Bunker in their, you know, enclave of the highest concentration of Scientologists anywhere in the world. So 
that pretty much put paid to any claim that they have millions of members. They they never have had millions. They may have had a hundred thousand or a couple of hundred thousand back in the seventies or the eighties, but today, no way. You um you escaped in two thousand seven, if I recall correctly, which is roughly yep. like fifteen, getting closer to sixteen years ago. Do you think that you were still on the radar of the church? Are you being tracked? How closely do they? I mean, like, will will people from the church see this interview, for example, that we're doing oh, right ab now? Ab absolutely, David. You'll probably get a letter from a lawyer before you manage to put this up on anything. Um, oh boy! But but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't it didn't worry. happen with the last one. Hope, okay. so hopefully not this time. Yeah, but now my book is out, so they're going a little crazy. Yeah, you know, they're they're uh, paying for Google ads to any search of my name shows up with a Scientology Google ad. They're mm. putting up new smear videos and smear sites and sending legal threat letters and you know all the usual shenanigans that Scientology gets up to I'm certainly not gone off their radar in fact I came like right back into the center of it the day my book was released mm. um one of the things I think is interesting about your story and for people who want the details of how you ultimately kind of changed your mind about the Church of Scientology and ultimately left we go into that in detail in in our first interview one of the interesting conversations we're having now is generally about the deprogramming, as the term sometimes is, of people who are in a cult. It might not come as a shock to you that many in my audience believe that Trumpism is a cult and they see the people at the Trump rallies uh, uh, with with impossible stories and contradictory beliefs and a, an inability to ever kind of puncture the bubble in, in which they, they exist. And the question is, OK, so like what can be done to accelerate or help people along in in that process? What have you learned in your experience about what can be done from outside the cult to help people in it see the truth or something closer to the truth? Well, from my experience, it's very tough. It is very tough to penetrate that barrier. But in the case of Scientology, what I tell people to do is use the words of L. Ron Hubbard as the entrance point to get them to look. Mm. You know, Hubbard said a lot of things, many of which are contradictory. And on, on one hand, he said, you know, do everything that I say and read and follow it exactly. On the other hand, he said, believe what, you know, what is true for you and look, don't listen and, you know, uh, think for yourself all of which are very contradictory to the actual teachings of Scientology. But if you quote those things to a Scientologist and say, look, Hubbard says you've got to think for yourself. Hubbard says you've got to look, don't listen. Hubbard says what's real for you is what's real for you, not what someone tells you is real. So don't you have an obligation to follow what Hubbard says and actually look at information outside of that bubble? Mm. That has limited success. Yeah. I, I don't know, David, anything that actually is a guaranteed silver bullet. There's no no garlic for this vampire that works 100% of the time. It just is sort of... The one thing I do know that doesn't work is to tell them they're stupid. Right. Tell them that they're, that they're completely ignorant and stupid and that they just are, are fools because that plays into their own stereotype that the rest of the world are the ones who don't know what's really going on. The other thing that outside, not as applied specifically to Scientology, but that's often mentioned by critical thinking folks and skeptics and this type of thing is that just like bashing people over the head with facts also isn't very effective. So like as applied to Scientology, that would be like explaining the scientific impossibility of some of the origin story that's told or whatever. Is your experience also that talking about the impossibility of that is not effective? Yes. Oh, that 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 is useless. Mm. You can't approach someone who has beliefs and try and undermine their beliefs. Uh, the only thing that I have seen that works is the demonstration of the act in the real world that are contradictory to those beliefs. Hmm. Like if you take someone and say, 
you can't believe that there is a virgin birth, then you're going to have a real hard time with most Christians convincing them that there is no such thing as a virgin birth because mm. they believe that that is the case. If you say that there are, uh, look, this, this uh, priest uh, molested this child and has been convicted of that and the church covered it up, it's a much harder thing to overcome that and just go, well, I don't really care because I believe in the Bible. So you got to kind of find the things that are demonstrable in the real world that are, and but, you know, even that doesn't work most of the time. I, yeah. I mean, the, the justifications and explanations as to why things are the way they are or how they're rationalized can be pretty, pretty out there. I mean, I see these people and, you know, I, I watch your channel and a bunch of other stuff and I see people that, you know, JFK Jr. is alive and well and right. you know, like, uh, you know, yeah, like what? <laughs> So one of the um, one of the things that's commonly told by people who were sucked into organized crime is that the way that they ended up all the way in started relatively innocuously. So it might start with, hey, can you just run this envelope across town for me? And yes. there's this kind of process through which you're before you know it, you're much further in than maybe you ever would have imagined yourself to be. Similarly, you know, to, to take Trumpism, there's a lot of folks who in 2017, if you said, hey, you know, by 2020, this guy's going to be suggesting injecting bleach to treat, uh, you know, a, 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 a disease that you haven't even heard about yet. A lot of people would have said that will never happen. There's no way. But slowly we get there. We get there drawing on a hurricane map with a Sharpie and it gets more and more and more insane. Do you find that that takes place with the recruitment of Scientologists? Oh, absolutely. I mean, David, that's what my book is about. My book is about my immersion into the the world of Scientology to the point where I was as dedicated and as convinced that Scientology was the only route, the only salvation for all of mankind as anybody could be. I mean, I became the the international spokesperson of Scientology. I was like the head of the dirty tricks department that dealt with the enemies of Scientology. I was 100% convinced, not that I was doing bad, but that I was doing good, mm. that I was saving the world, that I was saving every man, woman, and child on planet Earth, and that this was the most important thing that could possibly be done. And I, I hope that anybody who reads the book will understand the parallels between my experiences in Scientology and what they see with other people who act insane. What, what were some of the small asks that, that they start with? Well, it really started for me when I was a child and my parents got involved and they started saying to me, look, the solution to this problem is contained in what Ron Hubbard says is the answer to this problem. Do what Ron says. And your worldview becomes L. Ron Hubbard solved every problem of every person on earth and all of mankind and laid it all out for us. And if we're too stupid or too lazy to find out what all those answers are and apply them, then more fool us. Mm. We need to be dedicated because he has come up with the answers for everything. And as soon as you start down that path, path that there is one person who has got the answers to everything, you then go into some of the answers and those answers become themselves the next step in that immersion process. You know, there are a lot of them in Scientology. A big one, a huge one is that you have to be responsible for your own condition. And this is a, um, uh, you know, a platitude that Hubbard came up with that has some applicability and validity to it. But 
when you take it to the extreme that it's taken to in the Hubbard circumstance, it means in Scientology, if you get run over by a car, it's your responsibility. You are responsible for, for the condition that you, that you got yourself into. Right. And that means that at some previous time, you ran over someone else with a car right. in order to feel the need to be punished and punish yourself by getting run over by a car. Right. This is the ultimate in victim blaming. And it is also the ultimate in no matter what bad thing may happen to you in Scientology that Scientology may cause or do to you, it's your fault. It's not Scientology's fault. Right. Yeah. And of course, those are the types of arguments that are completely unfalsifiable. There's absolutely no way to argue that it, that it's untrue. Um, the book is a billion years. My escape from a life in the highest ranks of Scientology. We have been speaking with the book's author, Mike Rinder. Mike, really appreciate your time today. Thank you, David. It's, it's great to see you again.